This is 49ers Talk brought to you by Big O Tires and Laura, congratulations are in order. Oh yeah, for me? For both of us. For what? Well, haven't you heard? We are huge in the Republic of Mozambique. Oh, this news. This, you know what I'm really excited about? I'm glad that you're excited about that and hey to everyone listening there. Um, we're also, Fiji is a, is a Fiji. popular place for 49ers talk and I will take any and all um, tourist yep. recommendations because I just sense a trip coming. And, and I think you're, what you're also saying is you will accept any free tickets Oh, that's, that's basically what I'm saying, yeah. And, and lodging, exactly what I'm saying. yeah, and everything else. So I did share this news with my family, and obviously to, to fill everybody else in, our, our boss, Justin Hathaway, who apparently has nothing better to do than to go into all these analytics. It was like a Monday night at 11 o'clock or something. Yes, and apparently, it, I believe he described it as going down the rabbit hole of these analytics and, and looking at numbers for podcasts, and he sent us a screenshot of 49ers Talk being the number one football podcast in the Republic of Mozambique. That's right. Yes, and it was like, it was us, and then it was like some others that – you've heard of. So I, I passed this along to my family. I breathlessly told them, you know, of our great achievement. And Did Sarah they ban you with like palm leaves after that? Not quite. Uh, oh, okay. Not to Sarah, the reception you were hoping for? No. Sarah, my wife says, what does that mean? One person listened to it? And I was saying, well, maybe okay, fine. two or I'm three. Gonna I'm going to take the dog for a walk now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Dude, that's exciting though. I love it. I love that the 49ers have that kind of reach. I mean, that's, I, that's what that tells me that this franchise has wide reach and that hopefully people enjoy listening to our podcast is also what it tells me. Or, or somebody from San Jose got stuck in Mozambique and had nothing better to do than to click on our podcast. That could be it too, but you know, the options are endless. The possibilities are endless. We can take this whichever way we want to. Right. No one's going to tell us we're wrong if we just tell ourselves that. I don't know. Twitter will we, probably tell us that we're wrong. Yeah, probably. Hey, a uh, lot of 49er stuff to discuss. Um, we did finish the podcast earlier this week by previewing that we'd be talking about the quarterbacks and guess what we'll be talking about the quarterbacks but first yes we, didn't lie. <laughs> we did not lie we never lie that's the thing about us you come to 49ers talk you're always going to get like real talk we'll straight talk whether you want to hear it or not yes that's what good friends do <laughs> and we are good friends with our listeners hey i feel like uh with you were getting to this with jeff wilson jr signing a one-year deal with the 49ers. I thought maybe when I saw that, I was like, oh, is this the first domino to fall? Are we going to start seeing more? But I haven't seen anything else since then. No, but I think, I mean, it's that's encouraging because, but it's also, it's interesting because like we haven't even gotten to the point where those tenders come out. And so Jeff Wilson, a three-year pro, he was scheduled for restricted free agency. And so last year, if you recall, Kendrick Bourne was in the same situation. The 49ers put a second round tender on him, which is about three point, I think it was $3.4 million, something like that. And so you can tender these restricted free agents, the original round tender, which is about $2.2 million, or the second round tender, which is three point two or four, whatever the, the case may be. And so basically, if you if you res, you tender a restricted free agent, you get the right of first refusal. So if that, that player can negotiate with other teams, but if they sign an offer sheet, you as the team that gave that tender, you have the right to match the offer and keep the player. And if you choose not to, then if he's a draft pick, you get whatever round he was originally drafted in if you give him the original round tender. And then I'm going to quiz you, Laura. If you give the player a second round tender and you don't choose to match a, a, the second round tender, what do you think uh, you get? Is second round. Whoa, man, you're good. <laughs> it's like they put it in the name of it or something. Yeah, it's almost like that. Like who's buried in Grant's tomb, that kind of thing. Exactly. 
Um, and so w- what was interesting about the Jeff Wilson thing is that they signed him to this contract, a one-year contract, before this whole restricted free agent thing even played out. So that kind of leads me to believe, and I, the numbers haven't come in, that they, they didn't want to give him the original round tender, and they also didn't think that the second round tender was appropriate. So it's probably somewhere in, betu- in between with some incentives. And for Jeff Wilson, it's an opportunity for him. He knows where he's going to be. There's some peace of mind. There's some guaranteed money uh, involved with that as well. And so he knows that if he balls out this season, that he's going to be you know, a guy who will hit the open market next year and get some pretty good money. Yeah, do you think – I mean, I like the move by the 49ers to keep him around. I think he plays an integral part in the run game that Kyle Shanahan, uh, you know, uses so often. And that's something that, that Sage Rosenfeld, who you spoke with, um, you're going to hear that later here on 49ers Talk, talked a lot about and how important that run game is. And Jeff Wilson Jr. is, is a big part of that. Yeah, and it's – the 49ers are in a spot where – you know, they're going to be up against it as far as the salary cap goes. And to have Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson under contract, that's a really good starting point for this team. And, I mean, they I don't know that they even have to bring in anybody else who's going to make an impact this season, but they will because at the running back position, as we've seen it, I mean, those guys take a pounding. And so Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers certainly like the idea – of not just having one guy. And in fact, look at it, the last four years or all four years that Kyle Shanahan has been the head coach. It's been a different leading rusher for the team every season. And this last year, it was Jeff Wilson who opened the season not having any kind of role. Remember when, yeah, when the season started, it was Tevin Coleman, it was Raheem Mostert, probably flip-flopped, let's go Mostert, Coleman, and then Jarek McKinnon was the third down back, and Jeff Wilson was an insurance policy, and by the end of the season, Jeff Wilson was the guy. Yeah, and I think that's what's so interesting about Kyle Shanahan and what he's able to do with players, and I think this is also, again, uh, just with what Sage has to say, which we'll get to in just a moment, how great he is, not just with running backs, not just with quarterbacks, the entire offense he makes better. Wide receivers, when he was the wide receivers coach, I love the insight that we're going to get from Sage on that. 49ers Talk is brought to you by Planet Orange, effective, eco-friendly pest control. So I think the 49ers will still be in the market for running backs. They're so good. Bobby Turner, the running backs coach, is so good at finding these gyms. And one of the great things about Bobby Turner, longtime running backs coach, was with Mike Shanahan, has been with Kyle Shanahan at every stop, is that he really, at this time of year, gets to know all these running backs, like gets to know them really well. Like He knows their coffee order. Yes. And it is caffeine. They want for breakfast. Like, yes, he knows everything. Knows and I wonder if Zoom has – I wonder if that's impacted – how he's gotten to know them. But you have anyway. to imagine that it probably has. I mean, it is different seeing somebody in person and working guys out in person and seeing what they can do as opposed to just talking to people over Zoom. It's a little bit yeah. different. You still get the sense of somebody. But yeah, I think so too. And actually, you know what? I, as I recall, he, he is somebody who will call the, the players you know, right up until the draft and just kind of check in and keep tabs of them. So it's funny, just about any running back in the league knows – Bobby Turner, because Bobby Turner was such a, a big part of the pre-draft process for all these running backs because you know he's such a respected guy and, and he's constantly checking up with them. So um, uh, Jamichael Hasty, he's also yeah. under contract. And, yeah. and so he I would say that he's kind of the guy that you know is first in line to take over that third down. Role. I don't know if you heard what Jarek McKinnon apparently said. I didn't see it personally, but he was yes. on he was on a Instagram yeah, live. Debo, yeah, and yeah. He, it, it like Debo was laughing, so it made it seem like almost he was joking, but he wasn't yeah. joking. He was he, in essence, said he's out. Yeah, and I I think probably that's understood. Yeah, I, I would think that. I mean, he's he sees what's happening and how he was kind of pushed to the sideline uh, late in the season. And, and so, I, you know, I don't, 
frustrations with that, but think about what the 49ers have done for him. I mean, oh, no. Him, you know, when he was in a really bad place. So that kind of rubbed me a little bit the wrong way, just in, in that I would hope he would have nothing but gratitude for them. And, and he probably does. It's hard to – he doesn't want to leave, I'm sure. Yeah, and I, but I'm also sure that he sees that there's no spot for him. Yeah, and and I, and I don't know, you know, those exit interviews exactly how upfront they are with these players, but maybe they actually told him too that, hey, look, you know, we we gave it a shot. You know, I know the Forty Niners appreciated how good he was behind the scenes in those two years where he couldn't play, and then you know they went into this last season hoping that he would he would be the guy that they were expecting back in 2018. And he, you know, he, he was okay. He wasn't great. He stayed healthy throughout the season. Uh, I think he was always a good teammate. Um, always a kind of a cheerful and, and guy who walked around and kind of an uplifting personality, but yeah, it just didn't work out. And I, I, I think the same goes for Tevin Coleman. Tevin Coleman is a little bit, you know, a lot more uh, reserved and, and not quite as, um, personable or uh, not as much of an extrovert as yeah. Derek McKinnon, but you know, there's, there's just no spot for, for those two guys in particular, especially when you have that Bobby Turner and Kyle Shanahan track record of being able to find guys like Matt Breida, Jeff Wilson, Jamichael Hasty, And also, you know, what I heard late in the season or I, I heard throughout the year, but the the 49ers had uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire rated very highly uh, in last year's draft, and he's one of these guys with the Chiefs that if they had stayed at 31 and not traded up for Brandon Ayuk, that Edwards Hilaire could have been a guy that they would have taken in the first round of the draft. So that kind of makes me think that they will keep their eyes open for taking a guy that they really like when you figure that most are – and Wilson, as good as they are and as good of a one-two punch that they are, they're only signed through this upcoming season. So, you know, there's more work to be done for John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan. Yeah, and you mentioned it. They take a beating. In this offense, they take a beating. They're used a lot, and they're used a lot in different ways. So I think that's where you're seeing a lot of the injuries happen. And some of it's just bad luck, which is what we saw all last season with the Niners. Hopefully that doesn't continue on into 2021. But it is a, it's, you, need, you need as many running backs on the roster as they've had because of, because of the nature of what they're doing in this system. A, a couple other things I wanted to touch on before we get to Sage Rosenfels is that the 49ers have been making some uh, changes to their coaching staff, some of it by necessity, of course. We've already talked about D'Amico Ryans getting promoted to defensive coordinator, Mike McDaniel promoted to offensive coordinator because of the, some of the, the movings and shakings, Robert Sala taking uh, Mike McDaniel, some of the other assistant coaches with him to the Jets. The 49ers have hired James Betcher as a uh, defensive assistant. And so he's an interesting guy because he was a defensive coordinator with the Arizona Cardinals for three years. And each of those years, uh, what, what were the years, 2015 to 2017, each of those years, the Cardinals had a top six defense. And they ran a very aggressive 3-4 defense. The 49ers, of course, run a 4-3. But um, it, it's interesting because it, it kind of gives somebody – for D'Amico Ryan to kind of lean on and be a sounding board and maybe incorporate some of uh, James Betcher's beliefs and in, in some of the stuff that worked during his time. He was also, there's a squirrel running right outside my window. So we're like puppy dogs. Yeah, wow. I know. Whoa. And, and it wasn't even a shiny object. That was <laughs> um, anyway, um, not to get squirrely on you here. Oh uh, no. Laura. But, no, any, no, no. but anyway, he was also a defensive coordinator with the, the Giants, the New York Giants. So he's been in that coordinator's chair and somebody that D'Amico Ryans can kind of work with. Also, uh, Daryl Tapp, who played a long time in the NFL, but most importantly, he played two seasons with the Detroit Lions as a defensive lineman under Chris Kosarek. 
So Daryl Tapp, he's only 36 years old, but he's already coached four years in college. He comes to the 49ers to replace Aaron White Cotton as assistant D-line coach. So that's interesting. And then also Rich Scangarello. I think we've talked about this. He comes back to the 49ers as quarterbacks coach. And our friend Nick Wagner of ESPN reports that Shane Day, who was the quarterbacks coach last year, he becomes the Chargers uh quarterbacks coach and passing game coordinator. So he gets to work with Justin Herbert with the Chargers. So Brandon Staley, the first year head coach of the Chargers, who comes over after being defense coordinator of the Rams, brings Shane Day with him. And so those are some of the the movings and shakings with the 49ers coaching staff. Um, as the off season, the coaching part of the off season kind of settles down, and then the playing, yeah. the players, that's going to be ramping up here. Yeah, that's what uh, we're expecting to see over the next little bit. So, Mayoko, you brought up Chris Kosarek, and I actually got a, a tweet that we have not discussed on any of the podcasts when D'Amico Ryan's was named defensive coordinator, um, and Malcolm was was wondering why do you think. D'Amico Ryan's got the DC job over Chris Kosarek. I thought that was an interesting question that we haven't really, you know, dove into. Yeah, no, that is a, a very good question. And w- what I will say is that um, I kind of go back. I, I, I had a conversation with, uh, I, I think this was back in the days of like Jim Tom Sula with some coaches at that point and guys who are up for head coaching jobs and the kind of coordinators that they would look for. And I know it's happened in the past where a defensive line coach becomes a defensive coordinator. But I remember talking to, I think it was Adam Gase, and he he was talking about the kind of defensive coordinator that he was looking for. And he was, he, he had told me, and this kind of stuck with me, that you always want a coordinator to have a really good knowledge of coverages because coverages are so important you know what you call on third downs in the red zone and so you you always try to find a coordinator who is familiar with the back end whether it's a, a former defensive backs coach who understands coverages and route concepts and all that or a linebackers coach who has to know what's going on in front of him as far as the defensive line, but also has to know what's going on behind them and also how linebackers fit into coverage. So the easy answer is that Chris Kosarek is a hardcore defensive line coach, and it would be a really difficult transition to then take that and apply it to how you call defenses with the coverages, because that is the main part really of being a defensive coordinator. Yeah. And we, it seemed like it was a really seamless fit for D'Amico Ryan's to slide in there. And we'll, we'll see more next season once we see some of the first few games, but at on paper, it does seem like it works for D'Amico Ryan's to be right in there as DC. Absolutely. And so, uh, as we mentioned earlier, I did catch up with Sage Rosenfels and uh, you might be thinking, Laura, did you think Sage Rosenfels? Well, that's an interesting guest to have on the 49ers Insider Podcast. Yeah, I was like, where are we going with this? But he's got a lot of connections with the 49ers. He, he did. And, and, and so it's kind of been in the back of my mind for a year. I'm like, yeah, uh, middle of February of 2020 that wow, I want. I didn't know that, that, Matt. Yeah. And so here's why. So at the NFL Scouting Combine, which there won't be an NFL Scouting Combine this year, but I, I'm. I'm kind of like, I'm always, I'm around, right? I'm like everywhere. You're just the, the pest, that little I, I, I really, really am. And I'm always kind of keeping an eye out for people and like, kind of like that squirrel that was just outside my window. Always kind of, yes. You're looking for, for nuts to pick up, to store away for times when you know, I need them. Oh, you know, we need to do a 49ers talk podcast in the middle of January. <laughs> yes, that's. Exactly. And so there was a guy who I always saw around Kyle Shanahan who looked familiar, but I didn't know who it was. And then at this, this restaurant that where all the coaches and GMs and everybody goes to at the end of each night's meetings, um, that there's the upstairs. And oh, okay. so, I was wondering about this in the interview. Yes. 
So this yeah. is the backstory about what you're going to hear for yes. all of you that don't go to the scouting combine and don't know about what restaurant you're talking about. Exactly. And so Jennifer Lee Chan and I, my colleague, Jennifer Lee Chan, our colleague, Jennifer Lee Chan, we would always go upstairs where basically it, it turns into like the 49ers coaching staff and the Rams coaching staff because uh, Sean McVay is up there and Shanahan and all these coaches. And there's this guy again. And so uh, i finally figured out, oh, it's Sage Rosenfels. And then I like, oh, that's right. Sage Rosenfels knows Kyle very well because of their time together uh, with the Houston Texans. So I knew that he also uh, had a good personality and has done some media. So uh, th this just seemed like the perfect time with all the stuff going on with the quarterbacks, all the, all the chatter with the quarterbacks to get Sage Rosenfels in the 49ers Talk podcast. So here is my conversation with Sage Rosenfels. At Big O Tires, we're always here to give you a great deal. Now get up to $150 in savings. Save $100 instantly on select tires. Plus get a $50 mail-in rebate on purchases of $500 or more on your Big O credit card. Big O Tires, the team you trust. This is 49ers Talk, and it's my pleasure to welcome in Sage Rosenfels, a 12-year NFL player and living the retired life now. So so Sage, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me on today. Uh, I took a break from shoveling, I think, 10, maybe 12 inches of snow in my driveway. Just got back from Florida. It was 16 degrees last night. Uh, somehow the plane landed. The, the, the runway looked a little uh, shiny for my liking. But uh, yeah, I, I retired to Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and, uh, and here I am. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, so what are you doing now? Besides shoveling snow, that is. Yeah, so I would say number one, I'm raising kids. Uh, three kids. Um, one just got off to college. My son, who's out in Los Angeles, I have a 16 year old daughter and a 10 year old daughter. So I would say raising them is probably where my mind is at. You know, at least a good half the time, right? And then the other half, I try to keep them busy with. I would say like various football related, quarterback related, part time jobs which is nice. It keeps me busy. I, I train quarterbacks, you know, not necessarily 10 and 12 and 14 year olds very often, but some, some really good high school quarterbacks and then some college quarterbacks I just trained Ian book uh, for a week down in Florida to get him ready for the senior bowl, which is going on right now. I was actually watching some highlights of his day one thing earlier uh, today. So uh, and that, and I do some media stuff. Uh, I used to do a lot more than I do now. I still do a Chicago radio show where I get to talk about Mitchell Trubisky every single Tuesday. Yeah, well, my podcast here, we, we just talk about Jimmy Garoppolo pretty much every week, like you would talk about Trubisky. And and so anyway, the, the main reason I, I want you on, Sage, because- We, this can, is, about, we can talk about Jimmy Garoppolo. Oh, we, oh, we will. I've, Trust I've me. watched my fair share of Ford Nation. I, I don't watch all the games. I'm not breaking them down. We can get into his throwing motion today if you want. Okay, to. we can we, we can, can get into all that. But scared to take hits uh, <laughs> if you want, at this point in his career. Okay, um, it, it, we, there's a lot of things we could talk about with him. His quickness and his his release though is imp mm -hmm. so impressively crazy. Like you don't get guys who can uh, have that type of quick release, and and some of the things that he does, he does very well. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's the Forty Niners are a fun team to to talk about for me, obviously in the cover because of just my relationship with Kyle Shanahan and, and all those coaches that were on that. And almost every coach on that staff, even the equipment manager was our equipment manager to the Houston Texans. But from Wes Welker, who I played with, who we signed as a punt returner off the street uh, to D'Amico Ryans, who was, we drafted him in Houston. Uh, Robert Sala was uh, quality control in Houston as well. When I was playing there, um, it was quite the three years at least as far as the coaches and some of the players that went on and went on to, to, to great things after the Houston Texans of 2006, seven and eight. Yeah. You almost, you just almost ran down the list that I was going to lay out for you, but yeah, you spent five years with the Texans. Kyle Shanahan was an assistant there. Uh, three years, three years with the Texans. Well, I thought you were with the Texans from 2006 to 10. No, no six, seven and eight. And then 2009, I worked a trade to the Vikings. I was hoping to start. Uh, and then this this guy Brett Favre showed up, and so much for that. Uh, so then the next year I got traded to back up Eli Manning. So then I had this at the end of my career, okay. got the back up sort of two, I guess legends, you know, Favre and, and Eli, and 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 learn there the way they played, and obviously Eli's system and the way they. So it's sort of that, but but yeah, the the football coach wise, probably the most unique. Um, 
place I was at was the Houston Texans with Kyle and, and, and Kubiak and that whole group. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I need to do better research next time I get you on here or anybody else on, but what, one of your coaches also Mike McDaniel, um, who's now the 49ers offensive coordinator. And you mentioned D'Amico Ryan's the 49ers defensive coordinator. You have Kyle Shanahan. Could you tell, and, and you mentioned Matt LaFleur and Robert Sala, I don't want to lump all these guys together, but when you're a veteran player, you'd at that point been in the league six years. Um, could you tell that those guys weren't just kind of passing through that they were going to be destined for big things in the NFL? Yes. I mean, definitely Kyle in the sense of I just, how much I learned from where the first year I was with him, he was our wide receivers coach and he made an Andre Johnson where they, great player right uh physically he had so many skills and he was competitive and had those things but he made him into a great wide receiver mm-hmm. that year uh and then the next year even and, and then he became a core bass coach the next year but even as core bass coach you could tell he was there was some coordinator in there he was adding things to our offense kubiak was letting him do more things and then the third year where not only was he a coordinator but he was calling a lot of plays and Kubiak had always been the guy calling plays. And so he made me into a pretty decent quarterback. Uh, and, and, uh, and I was always a third string guy and then some second string. But when I played for Kyle, it was really the first time that I felt like I, could, I can play this game. I can be a, an NFL quarterback. I can be one of those guys. Um, everything sort of made sense. He got guys occasionally wide open. Um, he got you easy completions. The running game was always great without having like a great running back. He made a, an offensive line that had, you know, uh, nobody was really drafted high. I guess we had Dwayne Brown, who was a first round pick at left tackle, but for the, we'd have guys going to the Pro Bowl that were seventh rounders or guys that were cutting other teams go to the Pro Bowl. How he made offensive linemen better. Um, but, you know, I was six and four as a starter down there, and three of those losses were to the Texas or were to the, uh, the Indianapolis Colts and Peyton Manning. And one was to the Baltimore Ravens. And so I played pretty good winning football. And again, you know, just the, the things that I learned from Kyle and Kubiak, um, but in particular Kyle, are, are things that I hadn't heard before as much that, that would help me anticipate, help me get, you know, get the ball out quicker, help me be more accurate. And uh, I knew, you know, and then how, as, as Matt LaFleur came on and he was quality control, I was McDaniel was so involved and in even the running game and he was making all the sheets, but definitely involved with ideas uh, and those things. John Benton, who just left to go to the Jets, was our offensive line coach during that era. So it was I everything just made sense uh, in how they did things. And um, it was easier to play quarterback in their system than it was to play in a lot of, the, a lot of other systems I played in, in the NFL. And, and so I, I know you remain in contact with them. I see you at the NFL Scouting Combine. I won't see you this year at the NFL Scouting Combine, but you're all, you always get the invite to that second level at, at uh, Prime 47. So, uh, so I know that you, you remain in good contact with those guys. Uh, I do. I do. I get, the Combine is a trip for me. So we talked a little bit about Jimmy Garoppolo earlier. Now I'm just going to give you the, uh, the floor here to, to give me your thoughts on – you as well as anyone know what Kyle Shanahan wants in a quarterback. My question to you is, does he have that with Jimmy Garoppolo? I think, um, and I don't know this as far as from Kyle, but I, I have a feeling that they would like to have a guy who is not just a thrower. I think they understand that the future of the NFL is you have to have a guy that occasionally can run around and not just a pocket passer. It helps that bootleg game even more, um, but it also helps when your offensive line breaks down. You know, a good a, a quarterback that can throw is number one. You have to be able to throw. You have to be accurate, but you don't have to have a massive arm. But if you can have you know some of that Drew Brees type of of, of mindset and understanding of the game, and anticipation, and then the accuracy. But then the, the, the pocket will inevitably break down, especially when you have an offensive line that's not huge guys and the 49ers in that style of offense because you have to have guys that can run for that outside zone blocking stuff. Sometimes they struggle in pass protection. And to have a guy that can run around a little bit 
or even occasionally red zone run, I do think uh, that they would like to have somebody at some point um, that can do a little bit more of that stuff because they, they see how hard it is on defenses. You know, Kyle's smart enough to talk to Robert Sala, like how much harder is it to play against, you know, whether it's Seattle or, or Baltimore when they have these guys that really can run around and, you know, Kansas City. And I think they've realized if you can have a, a good throwing quarterback that's also a guy that's a pretty good runner, that would be uh, probably more, more bang for your $30 million buck that the quarterback position is. Um, so I, I think they are, you know, well, I'm probably going to be looking for an upgrade. You know, they, they realize that you look at those championship games, four great quarterbacks playing in those championship games. And do they have a great quarterback? They don't, uh, in my opinion. They don't have a great quarterback. They have a good, they have a good NFL starter, I think, but not a great quarterback. And I think they're, they're definitely on the hunt for that. Kyle's dad probably learned, you know, you learn that more than from anything, right? Uh, you, you, you get a John Elway, a great quarterback, and those great players, just, they just know how to win games. They know how to make that big throw, whatever it might be. And, and so I think they're on the hunt for one of those great quarterbacks, young guy or, or older guy. I, I always get the sense with Kyle that, you know, he's never said it publicly, but I always get the sense that he's, he gets frustrated by Jimmy just because, you know, I don't think Kyle would be a great poker player. You know, you can read him, you know, when he's on the sideline, when, when Jimmy misses a throw or, or you know, doesn't throw on – on time or whatever the case may be, you can see Kyle's body language is almost like, oh, here we go again. So I can tell you why that is, all right, Um, in my opinion. It's because the play that Kyle designed and the play that was there, that Kyle saw was there and he got the look he he wanted. Um, And when it's missed, that, you know, you only get one shot at those, right? Whether it's a post or even some sort of inside slant on an RPO. Um, every play is really valuable and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of thinking to get the right look, the right, you know, and then to miss a throw. A NFL quarterback should not miss very many throws. Mm-hmm. Just shouldn't. And, uh, I, I think that's probably when he gets most frustrated. Yeah. There's, you know, and I'm not going to say the name of the quarterback, but there, a quarterback on another team, he once referred to me as, you know, he's automatic, w- which I- I'm assuming that means you would know better than I, but that means when you get that look, the right play call, he's going to complete that thing or at least put it on the receiver 100 out of 100 times, right? Is that Yeah, yeah he just doesn't miss throws. Yeah. You know, good, good golfers don't miss a lot of six, six-footers. They knock those suckers in. And especially when they know they have the right, the right read and they, 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 they don't miss those very often. And so it's hard to get guys wide open. It's hard to get the right look. Uh, and when you get it, you have to you know, make the most of it because a lot of times you're not going to get the right look. Uh, or the right guard breaks down, you know, and, um, and you know, you're not going to make every throw, but uh, you, you don't want to miss too many open ones. So late in the season, both Kyle and John Lynch said that they expect Jimmy to be back as a quarterback for the 49ers this coming season. And I read that as they've done kind of their preliminary homework and figured that it's probably not likely that they can go out and get somebody who's going to be better or even significantly better than Garoppolo. But since that time, you know, we, we've heard about, you know, Matthew Stafford's going to be getting out of Detroit. You know, there was that kind of weird thing over the weekend with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Deshaun Watson's could be looking for a new home. Uh, the Rams certainly are not giving Jared Goff a vote of confidence. Uh, who knows what could happen with Matt Ryan. Um, heck, your buddy Trubisky. You know, he's going to be out there. You're shaking your head. No, no, no. Well, Trubisky, who I've, uh, I've sort of described as Jake Plummer. Remember Jake Plummer, not yeah. a pocket mm-hmm. passer. But in this system in, 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 uh, in Denver, they went to the AFC Championship game. Uh, I can't remember what year it was, 2004 maybe, five. Uh, uh, would it, uh, would have been I think it was the year before Kubiak went, came to the Texans. Okay. But they went to the championship game, and it was almost all bootlegs and play actions and get the ball out quick. And, and because Jake was not your, like, you know, he was not Peyton Manning, big, strong pocket passer or whatever. He was an athletic guy, and that's what Trubisky is. And so this was the, our Chicago, not to change the subject, but the Chicago Bears discussion for years has been, I don't know why they have him in this offense because it's in shotgun all the time. There's no play action. There's no 
Man. You know, that's hard on a quarterback. And sure enough, they started winning games at the end of this year by they completely changed their system where we're trying to run what I would call a VHS copy of the Matt LaFleur, Kyle Shanahan, mm -hmm. you know, you know, no system. They didn't have all the details. It, I didn't defined think VHS copy. Well, you know, it's like not, it's, it's trying to be as the original, uh -huh. but it just doesn't have all the detail. No, no high def. It's not, doesn't have the high def like, ooh, they right. should, they, that's not coached correctly. Right. Right, because Kyle and those guys have sort of mastered the best way versus all these looks to coach these just little details of how a tight end blocks somebody or how a guard steps or just the little things. And until you, unless you've been really doing it for a long time, you're just going to knock into those details. So they, I call it a VHS copy when you, know, you try to copy somebody else's play, but you don't know all the details and why they installed it. Oh, great play, but what was the look actually they were looking for and why and why, why does it work? And uh, a lot of people try to copy Kyle Shanahan stuff and Sean Payton stuff and those guys that are regularly having success in the NFL. So, Sage, what makes sense for the 49ers? You know, what makes sense for the 49ers when it, as it so, pertains to the quarterback position this offseason? Yeah, a football team is, and like a coaching staff, a quarterback is like, is like having a girlfriend. Except for you have to have a girlfriend. You can't be single. So you can't break up with your girlfriend until you have what you think is a better girlfriend waiting in the wings. That's just the way it goes. Cause you can't walk around with no quarterback. All right. And so it's sort of like that. I think that they are looking. I think that they probably know they could get back with their healthy again next year and get to the Super Bowl. I mean, they, they were in the Super Bowl just a year ago. So I think they know Jimmy's probably good enough to get back there, but could we get somebody who could get back there regularly? Um, and, and, you know, three, four, I mean, Kansas city where everyone's thinking they might go to like five Super Bowls the next 15 years. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't know that, but I, I think obviously Kyle would like to be in five Super Bowls in the next 15 years. Tom Brady's in his 10th Super Bowl, just insane. And I think, you know, as, as any coach, they want to be like the most successful coach ever. And so they're looking for that great player. Jimmy's not that great player. Yeah, I, I guess to kind of expound on that, Kyle, I'm sure, would love to be in a position where sometimes the guys on offense kind of cover up for his mistakes whether rather than him being solely responsible for dialing up the plays that get the offense where it wants to get. So this is what I – when I'm watching a football game and, like, some guy blitzes off the slot and Deshaun Watson makes a miss and scrambles around and, like, throws it 30 yards downfield to somebody that's open, who makes an incredible play, I'm like, huh, great coaching. Great coaching. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that, that, that is a part of football. Yeah. That is a part of the game. Coaches try to control everything. They want you to run their plays, and they have all these rules, and there's all this that goes on. But there are so many times in the game – where it's the Jimmys and the Joes, it's not the X's and the O's. And uh -huh. Kyle's smart enough to realize a great quarterback gives you some of that Jimmys and Joes because he can't call the perfect player all the time. Okay, so let me throw some names at you, and you tell me if these guys are upgrades over Garoppolo. And let's start off with Trubisky. Uh, no. Okay. Um, Matthew Stafford. Yes. And why? Matthew Stafford has had to carry that franchise and that football team on his back for I'm not sure how long. Uh, was it 12 years probably he's been in the NFL, something like that? Uh, they've never had a good defense. They've rarely had like a good running game. You know, they just they haven't had a first-class operation and, and coaching staff. Playing in a tough division as well. He would then come to a team, and we've seen it with, with – teams that get good veteran quarterbacks, whether it's Tampa Bay this year um, or when Peyton Manning went to um, uh, Denver, uh, even Phillip Rivers, um, a, a, a really good veteran quarterback put on all of a sudden a very talented, very well coached, very well run organization and football team. You, you do see some guys having a ton of success in those situations and he wouldn't have to carry the football team on his back anymore. And he could just be a part of the offense, not the offense. And that's where Kyle's system 
allows guys to be pretty successful and, and just sort of be an important aspect of the offense, the most important piece, but they don't have to carry the whole thing on their back. And Stafford has done that so much. He, he, I think he would probably accept. And he's athletic enough. He's got the big arm. He does have a big arm. He's pretty – he doesn't miss a lot of throws. Uh, and he's gutsy. He's a very gutsy guy, and, and I know Kyle loves that. At the end of the day, he likes it when guys are, are aggressive and gutsy. So then the question becomes, what, what price is too much for the 49ers to go out there and get Matthew Stafford? I, you know, I don't know. That's, yeah, right. That's, I mean, that's, 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 uh, you need to call Mike Tannenbaum for that or <laughs> one of these you know, <laughs> fired general managers that's in media for those types of questions. And then I think you, you and I can both agree that Deshaun Watson would be a, a significant upgrade, but the price. Deshaun Watson, I? I don't, I mean, it would, I mean you got to think it's going to be two first rounders. Yeah, right. And, and, then, um, and then Aaron Rodgers, significant upgrade, but probably won't be available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Aaron Rodgers thing, I, I, I tweeted something about that I'd like to see him. I, I think that would be great. Obviously, he's from California, uh, one thing. But, you know, I knew, I knew when Matt LaFleur got that job. And again, this system that I had had pretty good success in, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know how it's going to go with, Aaron's personality and Matt LaFleur being a, uh, a more, you know, not laid back, but he's a quieter guy. Um, he's not a big rah-rah guy. I thought it would go well because Matt's a pretty good communicator. And he doesn't have like some huge ego, but I knew Aaron would have a ton of su success in it. Do you see the Vikings doing anything with Kirk Cousins this offseason or is he pretty well locked in there? I think that I think they would really like to and they can't. They, I think they really screwed themselves. I, they, they signed Kirk to that three-year guaranteed $84 million deal. And then they add an extension on to it. Mm -hmm. And I just, Kirk is just one of those guys where if you look at his stats, it always looks like Kirk had a pretty good game. But he never makes anybody else better. He never makes that right guard better. But I, right? I get he the never sense, makes that left tackle Sage, better. I get the sense that Kyle likes him a lot. He, they have always liked him a lot because he is going to do exactly what they design, right? He is, a, he is an executor. He's not a playmaker, okay. right? The pri and they, they do like him. I'm not sure how much they like him. I know they used to, but I'm not sure after, you know, Kubiak's, you know, Kyle's going to call Kubiak and be like, what do you think? You know, is, is, you know, and I've watched enough Vikings games where he's just, they do whatever they can to make the job as easy as possible for mm -hmm. Kirk Cousins. And they're, it's always going to be nine and seven to eight and eight to seven and nine. He's just, again, he's some quarterbacks aren't winners. I know like winning is not a quarterback stat, but I don't know. I mean, Joe Montana won a lot of football games. Great quarterback. <laughs> Great yeah. stat, you know? Yeah. And then to put you on the spot a little bit here, I don't know how in tune you are with the college class, the, the draft class of quarterbacks coming out, but how many of these guys coming out kind of, you know, do you envision being potentially, uh, you know, first year starters or guys who can step in and, and be an upgrade over what any team that drafts them would have already on their roster. Obviously, I think Trevor Lawrence is a Andrew Luck, but more athletic and probably more talented type of player. Uh, guys that big are usually not that athletic. He has the Josh Allen stuff, but probably more accurate. And, um, and, 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 and there's a ton of stuff that he can do. I've always liked Justin Fields. I've known him since he was 17 years old. Um, the kid from North Dakota State, Trey, is it Lenz, Lance. I think? Lance. Lance. Um, supposedly he's very talented. I've just seen some highlights of him. Uh, I, I, as you look down this class. The BYU does, kid? BYU kid people love. I've just seen some highlights of him. He seems to play um, in an Aaron Rodgers way where he, it's more of an art form to him and less of a science. Mm -hmm. And, but he, he is out there making plays. He is making throws. He is freelancing. He is mm -hmm. athletic. Uh, so I think teams that, that excites teams. Um, can he consistently do that? Right. Can he play the game where it's not about making plays and athleticism? That to me is like where you, you, ha you have this, 
uh, really athletic, really good thrower, but can we make him into, can we give him some Kirk Cousins traits actually to just have him be a great kind executor? Of, kind of rein him and in. And when things are there, he can make the play because Kyle right. called the wrong play, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and could he, he could be one of those types of kids. But does he have that, does he have the mental capacity? Does he have all those things to become more of a Kirk Cousins executor and add that to his game? Ian mm-hmm. Book is sort of like that. He runs around a lot, pretty accurate thrower, but needed needs a, he needed some rhythm and timing and things like that into his game. And some people can't do that. They just they can't play the game that way. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's I, I think it's a very good draft class uh, that is going to be. I think there's going to be a lot of kids in that in those first three rounds. I'm not mm-hmm. sure how many first three four right. rounds. I feel like we might have like seven quarterbacks, eight quarterbacks in those first three or four rounds. Well, I saw your dog there. What what's your dog up to? Uh, my dog is probably wanting to go take a walk with me. Okay. I'm going to go shovel this driveway uh, <laughs> when, when we're done here. Um, I don't know. He's a, he's a Bernie's Mountain Dog slash mini poodle. So he is a nice. mini Bernadoodle. Wow. Is what he is. That's a mouthful so there. He is, is. He's a great dog. His mom was 130 pounds and his dad was like 25 or 30 pounds or something <laughs> like that. So a match made in heaven, obviously. But yeah, Bernie's my, he's my right hand man when I'm, and I'm hanging out the house. Well, cool. Hey, Sage, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, follow Sage on Twitter at Sage Rosenfels 18. He's a great follow. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, this time to get together and, and talk quarterbacks. And now I'll, I'll let you go out there and shovel more, some more snow. Thank you. Thanks for having me on today. And we're back on 49ers Talk. Hey, Laura. What? Get the breakfast you deserve with Wendy's two for four dollars. Two fresh made sandwiches for just four bucks. Price and participation may vary. I'm always down for a good breakfast, Mayoko. Always. Yes. And also I know that you're always down for some good quarterback talk. And I have to say, Laura, I'm I kind of feel bad. I I can I feel bad. Why? Well, because wouldn't you say that John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan have been very honest with us throughout their four seasons together as the, the general manager. And the head coach. That way, yes. Yeah. So here's what, here's what John Lynch said the day after the season. This is a quote. He said, Kyle and I have both spoken and spoken fairly directly as to the fact that we expect Jimmy to be our quarterback. And that's consistently met with other stories. So here we, so here we are another story. This is what we do, though. This, this is what, is what we, do. we do. We've and got so, to talk about it. This is what the people want to know about. This is what all of you guys listening, I'm sure, are wondering about. I love Sage's insight. I thought he had great insight into who Kyle Shanahan really is. Who knows him better than somebody that's been in all those meeting rooms and has been trained by him? And I loved what he had to say when you brought up that you feel like he gets frustrated being hmm. Kyle with Jimmy G sometimes. And how Sage was able to say, I, I think I know why that is. Yeah. You don't get that many opportunities. And you don't really think about, as a fan of the game, how much time and effort and energy goes into every single play that's called. It's not just the big, right. you know, when you're thinking about a game, you're like, oh, big picture, game plan, what's the overall? You know, we talk a lot of big picture stories, especially on TV, just due to time. We dive into it a little bit deeper here on 49ers Talk. But you don't realize how much time and effort and energy goes into every single play. And so if Kyle's standing on the sideline, calls the play, and sees that his quarterback misses an opportunity, that could be the game. And that's kind of what Sage was getting at, where that frustration comes from. And I thought that was really good insight. Yeah, you know, in the past when I've spoken to Mike LaFleur and Mike McDaniel about their roles in, in helping Kyle Shanahan, because they do in the past, this year will be Mike McDaniel doing a lot of you know the putting together the game plan and the plays against the defense they're going to be running and all this. What what they've told me is that they will, you know, come up with new plays, they'll take him to Kyle, and Kyle will say, Well, how does this fit into what we're doing? And they're like, well, it, you know, either they have the right answer or they don't. And basically, if it doesn't fit into what they're doing, if there's not a reason behind this play is called, like they don't do any like what, what they call standalone plays. 
you know, that every play that they have in their game plan for a particular opponent, there's a reason for it, whether it's, it's you like know, a book. You have chapters that all fit together. It, it wouldn't make yes. sense if you just drop another chapter from another book. Right. So the, those two guys really got into a good rhythm working with Kyle over a, of, over a number of years that I think fewer of their plays got thrown out, you know, before a game. But they said that, that hey, you know, that's, that's the process is you put in a play and then you have to or, or I should say it's probably the other way around. You, you figure out what fits into what you're doing and then the play goes in and then you have to sell it to Kyle Shanahan about why it works, what the, what the idea behind it is, what it might set up or what, how ha, has it already been set up and what it might set up down the road. So, I mean, it's a, it's a process. It's just not like, Hey, let's run a double reverse. Like, you know, like, Hey, let's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And that's what Sage was talking about is that there's so much thought and attention paid to every little bit of minutia, which with each play that when you set up that opportunity to make a big play down the field and you got the defense, you know, the right defense is called, or in the case of the defense it'd be the wrong defense is called for a certain play you need to hit on it. And that's where I think Kyle Shanahan shows that frustration with the, you know, the slump shoulders and the, you know, the kicking of the dirt or whatever. That was our moment. That was it. That was the moment and it's missed and it's gone. And now all of a sudden that's on film and other teams can study it. And so it, it brings up this whole other aspect of when are you going to be able to run that play again? When are you going to have the opportunity to use that? again, and you spend all this time at practice, practicing these plays and implementing them. So you get to the game. And, and I do think that's where a lot of the pressure that you see and you hear about from, you know, around the league, the media, all of that kind of weighs on a quarterback because you realize how important those moments are and how few and far between they are. And so you need to make every single one of them count. Yeah. Hey, it used to be few and far between where veteran quarterbacks like hit the open market or became available for other teams. But this off season has already been crazy and we're not even really in the off season yet, but uh, Deshaun Watson has formally requested a trade. He does have a no trade clause in his contract. And this, th this is very interesting because these are two guys who know Deshaun Watson, Daniel Jeremiah of the NFL network. He was a longtime scout. He said that, uh, Deshaun Watson is such a principled guy that he has a willingness to sit and lose money if he doesn't get his trade demand. And wow. Chris Mortensen, who also knows Deshaun Watson very well and has kind of been on the forefront of a lot of this Deshaun Watson news, retweeted that and said, this is true. So uh, the Texans have hired David Coley as their head coach. They reached out to Watson to let him know because they did not let him know when they hired Nick Casario as their general manager. But it really seems like the damage has been done. And I think you and I would agree, as Sage and I agree, that I think the price is just way too high for the 49ers to get involved with that because there will be other teams that can offer more. But what Deshaun Watson has in his back pocket is the, the no-trade clause. Yeah, I think I, we've talked about it at length here on 49ers Talk. I don't think that it's a realistic option. I think it's fun to talk about and fun to think about because he would fit right in. I think he'd be great. I think the 49ers would be great. It's just not realistic. I'm all about being realistic. You know, I don't want to waste yeah. anybody's time here. But it, Stafford is potentially realistic. And I liked what, what uh, Rosenfels had to say about Stafford because he talked about him being gutsy and that Kyle yeah. really likes an aggressive – gutsy quarterback and and Stafford fits that bill yeah and and he still has good football ahead of him he turns 33 on Super Bowl Sunday you know that's an age that Lord you and I will be at soon enough in our lives um yeah, but, but from what I understand for quarterbacks you know there's still there's still a window there there's still five six seven years or whatever he'd be under contract for for two more seasons and the fact of the matter is he's He's a really good player, and as Rosenfeld said, I mean, he's carried that Detroit Lions team on his back for so long, and now 
if he were coming to the 49ers, he would have better coaching. He'd have a better supporting cast on both sides of the ball. And the price isn't nearly as high to acquire him as it would be, obviously, for Deshaun Watson or Aaron Rodgers. And by the way, a quick parenthetical on Aaron Rodgers. We did talk a lot about him earlier this week. And, you know, he said his, you know, a lot of guys on the Packers futures are uncertain, you know, mine included. And then basically later, I think on Tuesday, he was on the Pat McAfee show, a very good podcast. And he basically said, Hey, you know, we're all living day to day. You know, basically. Yeah. And kind he, of throwing that rumor out. But. Yeah. And he, he basically said, I don't control my own fate in this league. And almost kind of said, the Packers, you guys started it because you're the ones who drafted Jordan Love in the first round. So anyway, he, he did say he, he can't see any reason why he wouldn't be back with the Packers. The Packers head coach and their front office has said there's no way he's going anywhere. So I guess we can throw out Aaron Rodgers. But when you look at the most likely or the most plausible guy who could be coming to the 49ers as far as a veteran quarterback, I mean, it's got to be Matthew Stafford. Yeah, I think so. I loved also what Sage had to say. I'd never heard this, uh, this little phrase before. A lot of times in the games, it's Jimmy's and Joe's, not X's and O's. And yeah. I thought that was a really good summary of – of a little bit of what the Niners are missing and that you want to see Jimmy be able to make a little bit more plays with his legs. You want to see, I'm not saying he has to be Patrick Mahomes. I'm not saying he has to be Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson, but you do want a little bit more mobility. Although Sage does think that's what the 49ers want. And of course, everybody wants that. You've got to, there's risk and reward. You've got to a, either draft that person and the, the draft capital has to pay off. You don't know. It's a question mark. Every guy entering the league, I think, is a question mark, There's no, especially at the quarterback position. It's very hard to evaluate who's going to be successful. And then there's also around the league, you can take a proven guy. How are they going to adapt in your system? But I thought that was a really good summary. Have you ever heard that before? Well, I think the 49, it was it Jimmy's and Joe's and not X's and O's? O's? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's what he said. It's a yeah. lot of Jimmy's and Joe's and not X's and O's. Yeah, well, I think the 49ers and their fans would like him to be less like Jimmy and more like Joe. That's, that's true. I don't think he was saying Jimmy being Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, but, yes, I do. Yeah, I yeah. think. But, but also, you know, he made the point, and I totally agree. Jimmy Garoppolo is a good quarterback. Like, yeah. he, he yeah. is a starting quarterback in the NFL. He's just not the Great. top of the line. But also, you know, I, every, every time I say that, people will also say, but he's not healthy enough. Yeah. And again, it, it, is that just coincidence? Is that just bad luck? Yeah, I, who knows? And but the the thing that I think would really make Kyle Shanahan happy, and I, I did mention this, is that you know Kyle, I think, is so used to dialing up the plays and kind of being the central focus, really, in a lot of ways of that offense. And it, as and one thing that Rosenfeld said was because of the style of offense the 49ers have, they're never going to have great pass protection because their well, offensive really linemen, interesting. Yeah. yeah, the offensive linemen are always going to trend a little bit more toward the smaller side because he wants athletic linemen. So if you're not going to have great pass protection all the time, you do need a quarterback who can kind of rescue a play. And it might not, you know, it's, it's not going to be every passing play, but it might be three times a game where that defensive end is screaming off the, off the, you know, the front side and you see that and the quarterback has the mobility and the agility to move around, get outside the pocket and either pick up, you know, a first down on third and six with their legs or, buy time for somebody to get open and, and make a big play down the field. So, hey, there's a reason that these quarterbacks don't come available very often because there aren't very many people who can do that. But this year's the year where there's a lot more guys out there available to teams who are looking for that than perhaps there's ever been. Yeah, and as you just heard, he's not dogging Jimmy G. He actually had high praise for him with how quickly he gets the ball out of his hands, mm -hmm. um, that he's a 
a NFL starter for sure. It's just, you know, how far can you go? Can he get them back there? I think those are the questions that still remain. And those are the questions. It's just, I, I say this so many times, I feel like a broken record. He's gotten them there. And that's the problem that I have with even saying that is right. he has gotten them to the Super Bowl. Sure, they didn't win it. That wasn't all Jimmy Garoppolo's fault. Yeah. Defense, that was Jimmy Garoppolo. That was the offense as a whole. It was, you know. It was the defense. Yeah, I mean, it was. The defense gave up 21 points in the final, whatever, six minutes of that game. Right. So that's where, you know, I don't want to put that on him because he has proven that he can get a team there in his, you know, first full season as the starter for the 49ers. So yeah. that's where it, it, it's, it's just the question, the question marks, giant question marks. Yeah. Remain. And that's why I feel bad is that, like, he's already done more than a lot of quarterbacks in the league, right. you know, being the quarterback of a Super Bowl team and, and being – you know, who, those who say that Jimmy Garoppolo, the 49ers can't win a, a Super Bowl with Jimmy Garoppolo. Well, I mean, they darn near won one a year ago, up by 10 in the fourth quarter. So obviously they could win a, a Super Bowl with him. But, uh, you know, can they consistently, can he kind of rescue the team when it has other blemishes? That's that's the question. That's a good way to put it, Mioko. I like that. Well, thank you. And I, and I still feel bad about questioning John Lynch and his, you know, but people consistently come up with other stories. Uh, those people. Yeah. Those people. Who are I, those people? I don't know. But let's, let's end it right here. Let's spend the weekend searching for those people and give them a good tongue lashing when we find them. We'll circle back next week. <laughs>